coming up on Lawmakers. A measure is introduced that would allow DNA comparisons for suspects. The House passes the FY08 amended budget. And an in-depth interview with Tom Crawford of CapitalImpact.com. Those stories and more are coming up next. This is Lawmakers, your source for all the news from under the Gold Dome. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelsky. Good evening, everyone. Also on Lawmakers, a measure designed to increase seatbelt use among teen drivers. And legislation that aims to help more Georgians afford health insurance. But first, our top story tonight, the House passes the mid-year budget. Mid-year, supplemental, or amended, whichever name you call it, the adjustments to the fiscal year 2008 spending passed the House this morning. The House Appropriations Chair said the emphasis is on education. We will take care of those equalization grants that were uh, slighted in the 09 document. Uh, they will be taken care of and made whole. This is not a time to be cutting education funds. You're going to see us in this document fund an additional $30 million to take care of that. At the same time, meeting those needs for school buses and technology and meeting our 1% reserve, our 1% requirement in the midterm adjustment. So this document mostly covers education. Representative Harbin also highlighted approval of the governor's $40 million allocation for reservoir development and $53 million for a statewide trauma network. Now it's up to us in 09 to come up with the money that we're going to need to, to sustain this and have a network all over the state that will be here forever. But right now we, are seven, we have over 700 lives above the national average that we are losing every year. People who are killed in car wrecks that shouldn't be, or killed in accidents that shouldn't be, if we had a trauma network. Let's vote this out unanimously, and hopefully the Senate will see the perfection of this document and move it without any amendments. Passage would not be without some debate. Republican opponents spoke out against annual budget increases. Four billion in this year's, three billion last year, two billion the year before. Add that up, that's nine billion dollars in new spending. You count the one billion dollars a year in bonded debt, that's another three billion. Next year you add the five billion plus another billion in debt. Now we're talking real money. Eighteen billion dollars in new spending from a Republican controlled House, Senate, and governorship. And Democrats called for greater distribution of the surplus fund for education and property tax rollbacks. We need to have a health reserve. We support a health reserve. But when it's more than a health reserve, we need to find a way to get it back to some priorities that we know are important to our school systems, our homeowners, that would help education in this state. Again, the supplemental budget passed the House today. The vote was 159 to 6, and it moves immediately to the Senate. Senator Bill Hamrick introduces a bill today that could aid law enforcement in solving more cold cases. Lawmaker Sandra Parrish joins us now with more. Sandra. David White now. Only DNA from convicted felons can be entered into the state or national DNA database. Senate Bill 430 would change that to allow DNA that is legally obtained from any suspect in a known case to be entered as a possible match to other unsolved crimes. The GBI says the case of missing hiker Meredith Emerson is a good example of why the legislation is needed. We were in the middle of working the Meredith Emerson case. And I was able to point to that very distinctly and say, we have Gary Hilton is our suspect in the murder of Meredith Emerson. We, can, we have lawfully obtained his DNA. We have compared it against blood found in his van. And we know that that DNA belongs to Meredith Emerson. But we cannot take his DNA and compare it against the hundreds of unsolved cases which we have in the Georgia DNA database. GBI Director Vernon Keenan says under Senate Bill 430, they could. This legislation enables law enforcement to take someone who is a suspect in a crime, lawfully obtain their DNA, and then have that DNA compared against the unsolved case files maintained in the Georgia DNA database. But Representative Ed Setzler, former chair of a House Biological Study Committee, has concerns. Prior to full felony conviction, there are some real concerns about using DNA for purposes of trolling against a nationwide database and frankly taking this DNA information outside of the hands of our law enforcement, making it available to the federal government in ways that we as a state can't rein in and control. 
Now, Director Keenan says since Georgia's DNA database was created, some 850 cold cases have been solved. He says hundreds more remain, and if this bill passes, it could help lower those numbers. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Sandra Parrish. Thank you, Sandra. We've learned that State Ethics Commission has launched an investigation into questionable campaign disclosures by Representative Sharon Beasley Teague. Through a random audit, the commission discovered Beasley Teague may have misappropriated, misreported, or misspent funds in violations of the Ethics in Government Act. At issue is $9,100 in expenditures and a campaign fund reimbursement to herself of more than $4,000. Before his death late last year, Representative Dan Lackley, chair of the House Information and Audits Committee was also looking into falsified reports dealing with mileage that Beasley Teague had claimed. We plan to have more information on this story on Monday. And only one bill passed the Senate today. That's Senate Bill 159, which may have folks who are running late filing for their homestead exemptions quite happy. Bill sponsor Senator Cecil Staten explains. I will be brief. I bring you a bill this morning that uh, has been brought to us by your county tax commissioners and their association. It is a bill that it simply extends the deadline for filing homestead exemption applications to mirror the closing of books for tax returns for the calendar year. The uh, net result of this for the citizens of Georgia is that in most cases they'll have an extra month to file for their homestead exemption. Are they going to try to do any education for the vote, I mean, for the homeowner or the uh, person that's receiving the exemption so that they'll know about us having done this? I don't think it'll damage them because it gives them extra time, but right. I hope they do some... Uh, Senator, I think we can certainly re uh, request that they do that. I think that's a very good idea, and they certainly should do that. Now, Senate Bill 159 did pass unanimously and now goes over to the House. In an effort to help the 1.7 million Georgians who do not have health insurance, Senator Judson Hill has introduced reform legislation called the Insuring Georgia Families Act. Lawmakers Bridget Snap is at the Capitol with more. Bridget. In Wandy, Senator Hill says one of the reasons so many Georgians are uninsured is because small businesses can't afford to cover their employees. His bill offers tax breaks and incentives to these companies to provide the much-needed insurance. Senator Hill estimates that his plan would help insure 500,000 Georgians, an estimated savings of $2 billion. Right now there's an unlevel playing field. If you work for a big employer, you receive health care benefits, health insurance for free, really, tax free. But if you work for a small business or you're on your own, then you have to pay for health insurance with after-tax dollars, which for most people is about a 20 to 40 percent difference. Senator Hill says SB 383 levels the playing field by offering tax breaks for small businesses purchasing high-deductible health insurance and providing incentives for health savings accounts. If you work for a small company now, you'll be able to, to ride off all your insurance costs, which helps level that playing field and save money. Secondly, we're trying to incentivize uh, small business employers, which are about uh, 5,000 or so companies in Georgia. We're trying to encourage and incentivize them to, to put money back into someone's account. $250 would be credited from the state to the employer per employee, for every single employee who has a, uh, a low premium health savings account plan. It will also incentivize you to, to keep track of cholesterol and blood pressure if you're a diabetic and you, you stay on your plan. Wouldn't it be nice to be refunded money from the insurance company? This bill allows under, would allow the law to be changed so that you could get money back into a, a health savings account if you're keeping your blood pressure low, for example, or, or losing weight, things like that. The bill has been endorsed by Governor Purdue and other groups who support a market approach to health insurance. We put together this, this team, this coalition, and came to agree on principles, free market patient-centered principles, and have collectively uh, written the legislation, and, and uh, we believe that this is the first step of a true free market uh, transformation of health care uh, for the United States starting in Georgia. SB 383 is currently in the Senate Committee on Insurance and Labor, and its companion tax bill is in the House Insurance Committee. Senator Hill said he expects hearings in the next few weeks. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Bridget Snap for Lawmakers. Thanks so much, Bridget. As we reported earlier, the main business of the House today was passage of the 2008 mid-year budget. The House also agreed today to allow retired teachers to return to the classroom while continuing to receive their pensions. This bill, ladies and gentlemen, will help Georgia deal with our teacher shortage. We're producing about 
35 to 3,900 teachers in this state. We're needing 15,000 new teachers every, every year. This will allow us to deal with that, to be able to employ some of our better minds to come back after about 12 to 12 months. The House also voted to reduce the age for tuition waivers at state colleges and universities. House Bill 941 drops that age requirement from 62 down to 60. And consideration was given to a measure allowing towing companies to use DMVS records to locate the owners of towed vehicles. Currently, uh, what happens is they're required by law to, to do this within 24 hours after they've towed the car, but it's all paperwork. And what they have to do is to go to the local police organization, and then the police have to call uh, DOR, and they have to get the information that way. Uh, what it does is burden the local police, and um, it causes an undue uh, requirement. House Bills 157, 941, and 157 all passed without opposition and moved to the Senate. Earlier in the day, news of a massive fire at the Dixie Sugar Refinery hit close to home for the Savannah delegation. One of those persons who is missing is the first cousin of one of our colleagues, Representative Bob Bryant. Bob was here earlier. He's gone home now. Representative Bob Bryant needs our prayers at this time, and all these families deserve our prayers. Would you join me now in a moment of silence, please? Thank you. Now, the Senate also took some time to pray for the families affected by the tragedy at the sugar refinery, but mentioned the importance of having a level one trauma center nearby for the many injured. Improving Georgia's trauma network across the state is a budgetary measure that many in the legislature aim to pass this session. What I think it what reminds us of is how quickly things can happen and how they can affect a community um, so uh, tremendously. We've been talking trauma for three years, uh, and we are now at the verge of, of doing something about it. The good news is there is a level one trauma center in Savannah, um, and all of the, the, the EMSs and the systems from all over the counties, including South Carolina, were there, the Georgia Air National Guard, the DNR, the Coast Guard, the GBI. The system worked. It is a timely reminder um, that, that trauma is critical to um, those that we serve. We have so much more in common than we think. We may be up here um, doing power struggles or whatever, but when it comes to tragedies like this, we all do come together, and I, and I thank you for your prayers for the families and, and for those who, who have been injured. And the trauma centers, as we know, are crucial, and we do need to put funding continued funding, increased funding, not cut funding in the trauma centers because it could happen to any one of us at any time, any of our family members, but just continue to, to pray and, and know that we're all God's children and we need to do what's right. And I just thank you so much for your prayers for those families in Fort Wentworth and Chatham County. Unfortunately, all six missing, missing persons in the explosion have now been confirmed dead. Penalties for teenage drivers may be increased if they don't buckle up. House Bill 924, known as the Billy Folk Teenage Seatbelt Safety Act, targets minors ages 15 to 19. Lawmakers Caroline Niaga has more. Billy Falk died in a car accident on June 8, 2006. His mother, Holly Falk, recently spoke to teen drivers at the New London School of Driving about seatbelts. Whoever is driving the car to... Uh not move until seatbelts are on. I know it's not, might not be the cool thing to do and you might have to look like the nerd or whatever, but um, the car doesn't go into reverse or drive until everybody's strapped in. If this bill passes, it means that many teenage lives will be saved because these lives that are lost now because they're not buckling up, over 50% of those possibly will be saved. What would make them buckle up more? And they said the fear of losing their license would make them buckle up more. Well, I think anything that will save your life is pretty cool, but um, some teenagers, you know, don't think that way. They think, you know, it rubs my neck the wrong way or, um, you know, whatever. I just think it's better to wear it being cool for, you know, 10 minute ride. We've got very intense on a lot of subjects. We have specialists coming on those subjects. And at the moment, one of our prime uh, concerns is seatbelts. And this is why we've been so active in this new seatbelt law. 
what we found is that many, many teenagers out of sight do not wear seatbelts, and yet nearly 100% that die, die without a seatbelt. I've been working for about a year and a half on bringing this law to fruition, and it went through the subcommittees this Monday. It's named after Billy Falk, the young teenager that died. Once this law gets known through the high schools, and once a couple of teenagers lose their licenses, they're going to realize that this isn't a game anymore, that you can be grounded, you can walk, you can lose your license. And what we're hoping for is when that goes through the high schools and these kids realize that they will buckle up. Holding Billy's shoe and wallet as a physical reminder of her loss, Holly gives this advice to parents. I would just advise them to make sure that the kids always have their seatbelts on no matter what. Um, I always assumed Billy was going to be safe and before he left the house I always said be safe and he said always mom and all it took was that one time. One time. That's all it took for 18 year old Billy to lose his life. The Billy Falk Teenage Seatbelt Safety Act is currently in the House Judiciary Non-Civil Committee. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Caroline Yaga. We'd like to recommend a website that's a valuable resource for information about the Georgia General Assembly. Go to www.legis.ga.gov. That website is a great research tool we at lawmakers use on a regular basis. Well, when David and I ran down this week's legislative news with Tom Crawford, national editor of CapitalImpact.com, I began by asking him to evaluate the seemingly smooth passage of the supplemental budget by the House. The House adopted the amended budget for the current fiscal year without a lot of fuss and, and bother, as you said. Uh, less than two hours later, the January tax collection figures came out from the Revenue Department, and they're very uh, disturbing. Revenues are down 7% in January, and growth for the year to date is only about 2%, and that's not enough to balance the budget. So the uh, state may have to dip into its reserve fund to get to the end of the fiscal year, and that's something for lawmakers to worry about, I think. There was a vote on the DOT board at the end of last week, and the repercussions of that have bled into this week. Let's discuss that. There was a big fight uh, between Glenn Richardson and Mike Evans, who's the chairman of the DOT board. Uh, Glenn wanted him to be replaced by legislators who elected members of the board. I uh, lobbied very heavily against the election of Mike Evans, but he got reelected anyway. Uh, the speaker found out who five of the House members were who voted for Mike Evans, and he punished them all to varying degrees by taking away committee assignments, office space, and things like that. It's the sort of thing that happens around here from time to time, but uh, because so many people were involved, there's a little bit of grumbling among House members. Uh, don't know how far it will go, but there is some un unhappiness out there on the floor because of what the speaker's been doing. Georgia is moving towards a statewide transportation plan, but it looks like the House and Senate have some differences in what that might look like. Yesterday, Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle unveiled a plan uh, that would allow individual counties or small groups of counties to band together, call their own referendum to impose a regional one-cent sales tax. The money would be used to make transportation improvements within that group of counties. Uh, over on the House side, I think the House leadership has indicated it's more in favor of a statewide uh, cent, one cent sales tax, perhaps, for transportation. So some significant differences there that will have to be worked out as we get through the session. When it comes to taxes, we just saw some revenue estimates that came out from January, and you saw them as quite alarming. Tell us about that. Well, the, the things like individual income taxes were way down, and that reflects the growing unemployment, which we've seen in Georgia and in other states. Sales taxes are also down, which is always an indicator that the economy is slowing, people don't have as much money, they're not buying as much, and that tends to ripple out into other parts of the economy as well. Now, the, the state budget is based on the assumption that we're going to have 2 or 3 or 4 percent growth in revenues, but when revenue growth keeps dropping, then you have a real problem there. You could have an unbalanced budget, which causes all sorts of constitutional problems, not to mention political problems, too. So uh, legislators could be faced with some very hard choices uh, before we get to the end of this session. Well, over on the Senate, they have uh, passed out uh, driver's license uh, provisions as well as uh, sanctuary city law that came out yesterday. And considering English-only legislation in committee over there as well, what does it say about uh, immigration this time around? Well, the legislation is clearly aimed uh, at the undocumented immigrants who are living in Georgia in growing numbers, as we all know. 
Uh, there's been a lot of concern from Republicans especially that perhaps there are too many of them. Perhaps we should discourage them from coming here. So these bills send out that signal. Uh, by making it a felony offense to drive without a license, they're hoping to uh, put some immigrants in jail who perhaps try to drive without a license. The English-only bill, of course, is to an attempt to discourage local governments for having their employees speak in Spanish, perhaps to Spanish constituents. So these are all the kinds of legislation that they're trying to send a signal to the Hispanic community, you know, we're a little bit unhappy with the way things are, we need to slow down here. We knew water was going to be a big issue coming into this session, and the governor actually signed the statewide water management plan, but there are some other things that happened this week when it came to water use. Well, there were some concerns that Governor Purdue might be sending mixed signals here because he did sign the statewide water plan, which I think is a very necessary first step to try to figure out where the state needs to go as our water supplies get lower. But then he turned right around and said, okay, we're going to lift the restrictions on outdoor watering for all the landscaping firms that want to put in new lawns, new shrubbery, whatever. And we're not going to uh, put any restrictions on the use of water for swimming pools, which it's great for the kids, and it's, it's a very important source of recreation for Georgians. But that's a lot of water, too. And I think there's a concern that he's perhaps not taking conservation as seriously as he should when he does things like this. We'll just have to wait and see how that works out. And then, of course, we have the possibility of some border disputes that might uh, possibly have come into the water uh, dispute as well. Well, uh, yes, there's nothing like a good border dispute to spice <laughs> up a session of the legislature. Uh, there are some legislators. David Schaefer, who want to uh, look at whether the northern boundary of the state should be shifted a mile north, uh, which, among other things, would give us access to the Tennessee River and the Chattanooga Aquarium, because it would put a slice of Chattanooga, along with several other small cities along the Tennessee border, into the state of Georgia. So, uh, if nothing else, it provides us with great entertainment value as we go forward here. <laughs> well, we talked about uh, DOT restructuring that's been going on this year, but the state's largest agency, Department of Human Resources, may be going through some changes, too. I think they will. Uh, Governor Purdue announced on Monday he's appointing a special study committee, which includes some of his top aides, two senators, two House of Representatives members, to look at the department and come up with some recommendations for breaking it up, uh, reassigning some of the other parts like public health to other agencies. There's been a lot of concern with the way that the department has been operated. Uh, you've had s several instances where patients in psychiatric hospitals have died under suspicious circumstances. So a lot of pressure on the governor to make some changes there, and I think this is his response to that. We started the legislative week with Super Tuesday. How do you think the uh, moving of the Georgia primary impacted the overall campaign trail? Well, it made Georgia relevant for one thing, and it really seems to have boosted an interest among the voters because more than two million people, which is incredible, uh, cast ballots for either a Republican or a Democratic candidate for president. And I think the interest or the increase in voter interest alone shows it was probably a good idea. All right. Well, we'll look forward to talking more about that in the weeks to come. Tom Crawford of CapitalImpact.com, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Reaction to DOT board elections, water, and transportation. These are just a few of the topics that have had lawmakers talking this week. On Monday, nothing happened because the House and Senate were in recess. So on Tuesday, reactions from last week's DOT board elections continued. Representative Tom Graves was one of four House members who were stripped of their committee posts by Speaker Glenn Richardson. The Speaker did not want them voting for current DOT Chairman Mike Evans. This is the time and this is the place to put principles over politics. And this is the time and this is the place to produce sound public policy over political posturing. Also on Tuesday, Governor Purdue signed an executive order establishing a commission to reform the Department of Human Resources. The governor has been working with the legislature over the past few weeks, and what we're trying to do is, is take a broad look at DHR and where it connects to DCH and state personnel and try to look and see how we can make it more efficient. And on Wednesday, it was wet outside, and coincidentally, water issues flowed into the Capitol when the governor signed the state's water management plan into law. 
This new law will lay out statewide policies and management practices. It also calls for the creation of regional water plans, which means that ultimately uh, local decision makers will have great input into how these watersheds are managed at the local level. The governor also announced that public swimming pools will be open this summer. We will be exempting outdoor swimming pools from the previous restrictions as well, so swim kids swim. The amount of water that would be additionally needed over the course of about May to October in some total to operate uh, the pools would be about 7 million gallons per day. That's 7 million gallons per day. Our water use exceeds 800 million gallons per day. On Thursday, driver's license and transportation issues got moving. The Senate passed legislation that makes it a felony getting caught for the fourth time without a license or with a suspended license. Similar legislation passed last year but was vetoed by Governor Purdue. As we passed last year, it makes it an, a felony on your fourth offense in five years to be caught driving without ever having been issued a driver's license. That's never having been issued a driver's license or driving on a suspended license. And the governor objected to the bill. He said, what about people that move into Georgia and forget to get their driver's license? Last year, the senator from the 12th offered an amendment, which I believe addressed that concern of the governor. But he just said that was, wasn't sufficient. So this year, with his assistance, we have a provision. If you show up in court charged on a first offense of driving without ever having a Georgia driver's license and show a valid Georgia driver's license, the charge against you is dismissed. And on Thursday, Lieutenant Governor Cagle and a bipartisan group of senators introduced new possibilities to fund transportation projects. By April 1 of next year, before counties can initiate the TSPLOS, the General Assembly will establish a framework by which counties can voluntarily join together into regions and combine their tax for projects of regional significance or do it individually. People in Fulton and DeKalb and Cobb and Gwinnett and all of the rest, we know what's going on because we're living it every day. We're sitting in traffic. If we do not move forward on this issue now, I'm afraid the voters will never forgive us. And that's a look back at what happened this week in the Georgia General Assembly. Coming up next week on Lawmakers, the House is expected to debate the child legitimation bill on Monday. On Tuesday, our leadership interview series continues with Senate Majority Leader Tommy Williams. And on Wednesday, we hope you'll join us at 10.55 a.m. for a live webcast of the State of the Judiciary Address. Georgia Supreme Court Chief Justice Leah Ward Sears will address a special joint session. We'll have all those stories and all the latest from uh, uh, Under the Gold Dome. That's next week when Lawmakers returns Monday night at 7. If you've missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, tune in Monday morning when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. You can also keep up with all the action under the Gold Dome daily on your local GPB radio station during Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and evenings at 6 p.m. on Georgia Gazette. So we will be back Monday through Thursday, and of course, so will the legislature. That's why we're on the air. <laughs> and then they're going to be back the following Tuesday, so there'll be a little four-day break there. and maybe well, The House has gone ahead and passed the resolution today. We'll expect the Senate to do the same on, uh, on Monday. And then, yes, we should have two four-day four legislative weeks coming up in the near future. Of course, we will be here every night that the legislature is in session. Now stay tuned for Rick Steves Europe Classics. Tonight's episode features Israel. That program's coming up next here on GPB. And that is our broadcast for this, the 14th Legislative Day of 2008. I'm David Zuskin. And I'm in Wandy Lawson. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday night. of Georgia Public Broadcasting.